Christian movies. They're not great. It's not exactly a hot take to say that Christian movies are bad. They have a tendency to be poorly written, poorly directed, poorly acted, and in a lot of cases, poorly received. I mean, just search the word Pure Flix on YouTube and 90% of the results will be of people bashing the streaming service and its movies. And again, not without good reason. But after watching all these videos and hearing all the different reasons why people love to hate Christian movies, I've noticed a common denominator, and that's that nobody reviewing these movies is actually a Christian. Demographically speaking, nobody reviewing these movies fits the movie's target audience, which is, of course, Christians. And you know, that's all well and good. It's not like they're scanning Christian passports at the PureFlix login screen, but it does make me wonder how differently, if at all, these movies might be received if they were reviewed by someone who is in their target audience, someone like me. I don't think a change of perspective will turn any of these flicks into masterpieces, since at the end of the day, a bad movie is a bad movie, but I wanna give it a shot and see if I can provide any unique commentary on these movies that other YouTubers haven't already provided. Also, bad movie reviews are funny, so I wanted to make one. That's the main reason I'm making this video. So after walking through the buffet line that is Pure Flix, I think I found the perfect Christian movie to watch, and it's called Beckman. Beckman is an unashamed John Wick ripoff where protagonist Beckman, played by David A.R. White of God's Not Dead and Jesus Man fame, Jesus Man, plays a contract killer turned suburbanite preacher who puts his violent ways behind him only to have to return to them after his adopted daughter is kidnapped by a cult leader. The John Wick parallels go deeper than that as there's this whole assassin underworld, but we'll get to that later. Basically, it's a Weenie Hut Jr. version of John Wick with a lot less cuss words but the same amount of gratuitous violence. So, you know, family friendly. Like I said, I'm not watching this movie just so I can absolutely bash it into the ground like other YouTubers like to do. That wouldn't be productive. I'm watching it because it's fun to watch bad movies and I want to see if I, as a Christian, can offer some unique insight on what I think the movie accomplishes, both as a means of entertainment and as a means for building God's kingdom. Because after all, this movie is a Pure Flix exclusive, so there's got to be some biblical takeaway. Whether or not that takeaway is that stealing is wrong and that John Wick isn't meant to be ripped off as a Christian movie, we're about to find out. So our story begins with Beckman and this other guy duking it out, and immediately you can see how this movie is trying to capture the John Wick look. You got your low lighting with bright red and blue accents, your mega close quarters gunfight, your wardrobe provided by men's warehouse. It's not subtle. Beckman kills the other guy, but also gets shot in the process. He snags the guy's gym bag, and while bleeding out from his wounds, decides, you know what, maybe it's time to put these killing ways behind me. Meanwhile, in a nearby church, a pastor named Philip is in dire straits. He's praying for God to come through because he doesn't have the money to pay his medical bills, and he says, I have to choose uh, medicine or the church. And the way that dilemma is worded makes it sound like he, as the pastor, is entirely responsible for providing financially for the church, and he has to choose between paying his medical bills or keeping the church afloat, which isn't how churches work. It doesn't really matter, though, because literally 10 seconds after the problem arises, Beckman comes crashing through the door bearing gifts. A donation. 350000 It's yours. And it's a good trade-off. Beckman gets patched up. Philip uses the money to pay his medical bills and donates absolutely none of it to the church. All's well that ends well. Having nowhere else to go, Philip takes Beckman under his tutelage, and over the course of the next year, Beckman learns what it means to follow Jesus. He prays, he gets baptized, he talks like Anakin trying to get on the Jedi Council. I'm here. I'm willing. I want to believe I... you're not ready. And for what it is, this sequence is fine. We get glimpses of Beckman struggling with the idea of forgiveness and letting go of his past, which adds depth to his testimony, but when his whole transformation is presented in the form of a montage with calendar shots to signify the passage of time, it just feels inauthentic, in my opinion. Like, how do we know that Beckman is turning from a life of evil to a life of good? Because he helps an old lady to her seat. I'm not saying that any of this is bad per se, I'm just saying that we're not even 10 minutes into the film and we've already seen him go from his lowest point to his highest. It just feels very rushed and oversimplified and Christian movie-y in my opinion. Anyway, Philip dies. A year goes by and Beckman becomes something of a pastor himself. He seemingly inherits the pastoral position that Philip left behind, which again isn't how churches work, nor does it seem like he's necessarily the right man for the job. You can't fool God. He knows who you are. He knows what you've done. Unable to put the sins of his past behind him though, he starts packing his bags and plans to skip town. But just as he's about to leave, there's a panic knock at the church door and he answers it to meet our leading lady, Tabitha. Tabitha, 
Tabitha is in distress for mysterious reasons. I don't want to talk about that. And she comes to the church seeking help from Philip. When she's told that Philip is dead, she tries to leave, but thankfully Beckman makes a really compelling argument to convince her to stay. Wait. Just wait. Yet another year goes by, and things are looking a lot better for everyone. Beckman is back behind the pulpit. Tabitha, who has apparently been adopted by Beckman, is getting involved at church. This lady who walked out earlier is back. Life is good. We're introduced to this strapping young lad named Tom, and really things couldn't be going better for our main characters. That is, until they could be going better because Tabitha starts crying again for mysterious reasons, and then we get a quick cut to black, and then this jarring transition to the desert where Beckman is pushing 70 in his car and screaming at... I don't know, 5% of his power. What is going on, you might ask? I don't know, this is happening so fast for the both of us. We get this shot that I appreciate of him pulling up to a mysterious compound, and just as he kicks down the compound's door, it fades to black again, and we get another card that says 10 hours earlier, which takes us back to the church, but now it's the evening. The first time I watched this, I was lost, but basically that whole desert scene was the opposite of a flashback, a flash forward, and we'll be getting back to it soon enough. Back at the church, Beckman, Tabitha, and this lady are having a pizza party. Pizza! Ooh. It's all fun and games until they're suddenly interrupted by not Alec Baldwin and his three cronies. Not Alec Baldwin, whose character name is Reese, is a cult leader, and we know that because he says stuff like, The ritual night is upon us again. I knew the universe would bring you back. You will do nothing but offer poisoned words to enslaved minds. This scene is funny to me because it's meant to be intense and to drive that point home, the writers are cool with killing a woman by pistol whipping her, but they still make sure to stay as far away from cuss words as possible. This guy says back off at one point, back up. but the first time I heard it, I swore he said bucko, and I just really wish that's actually what he said. Hey buckaroo, don't get any wise ideas in here. I got my finger on the flipping trigger, so if you want to be a smart aleck, I won't hesitate to rip you a new one. Like I understand why they keep the language clean. After all, this is a Pure Flix exclusive. It's just interesting how they're willing to show blood and violence for the sake of immersion, but they draw the line at cuss words. I get it, but it is kind of funny. We learned that Tabitha was trafficked into Reese's cult a few years ago, and it's what she was escaping from when she first met Beckman. Now, the four bad guys, one, two, three, four, kidnap Tabitha again. They knock Beckman out, the world fades to black, and when he comes to, this is where Beckman, both the movie and the character, go full John Wick. Just like how John Wick dug into the earth to retrieve his guns and stuff so he could return to his life as an assassin, Beckman digs into his gym bag and retrieves his burner phone. He apparently has the assassin underworld on speed dial because he presses just one button and has them on the line. Mr. Beckman, welcome back person on the other end of the phone hooks him up with some information and some guns, and just like that, Beckman is back. Yeah, I'm thinking on Beckman. From here, our protagonist starts tracking down all the baddies involved in Tabitha's kidnapping, starting with kidnapper number one, Eric. Which brings us back to the desert scene we saw earlier. Beckman kicks down the door only to come face to face with a bunch of guys from Gold's gym who wandered on set. He also finds Eric. A little scuffle ensues, but as you would expect, Beckman uses his superior assassin skills to come out on top. He kills Eric like it ain't no thing, then takes his phone so he can give cult leader Reese a call. Reese says more vague culty stuff. My future will be as it was revealed to me, as it always has been. And then this exchange takes place. Let her go. Now. It's impossible. That one's journey has ended as it was meant to. The desert drank her water. And she's returned to the void. Now, if you're fluent in the ways of cult speak, then you'll understand that Reese just said that Tabitha is dead. They killed Tabitha off screen, apparently. I am not fluent in the ways of cult speak, so I entirely missed this detail the first time I heard it, which made the next 30 minutes of the movie really confusing for me. I just feel like Tabitha dying is a really big plot point that the audience needs to catch, but that's hard to do when it's delivered in such a mystical way. Plus, the point isn't driven home any further by Beckman's reaction. I'll see you soon. We get a series of flashbacks between Beckman and Tabitha for character development, and then it's on to kidnapper number two, Janice. Beckman uses a little bit of mail fraud to find Janice's house. Hello, sir. I'm Fred Shapiro with the post office. And when he gets there, we're introduced to the best character in the entire movie, this guy. 
He's Janice's husband, and the only thing he's guilty of is desperately trying to be in the loop. What is happening? What is happening? What is going on? What, what is he talking about? Who is he? Just shut up. Janice's brother is also in the house for some reason, so once Beckman has everyone accounted for, he gathers them around the dinner table to have a nice family meeting. Where is Frank? There's this really goofy part where, as a means of pressuring Janice, Beckman shoots her brother, but since, after all, this is a Pure Flix exclusive, he does this. Raise your right hand. Raise your hand. Her. What? Ah! You know, the family-friendly place to shoot someone. Janice finally agrees to drive Beckman and the rest of the gang to her boss, but before they can get there, another scuffle breaks out. Janice, look out! Ah! They pull over in their 2019 Yukon Denali with built-in assist step technology, and everyone disperses. Beckman chases after Janice. She looks like she's going to get away, so he shoots her. He walks over to investigate. She rocks him over the head. He rolls down the hill for approximately 20 minutes. She rocks him over the head again, and he blacks out. When our hero comes to, we find him chained up in Janice's basement alongside a few other prisoners. We also gain intel that Janice is apparently a psychopath. Janice. I don't know her name. Sometimes her brother comes down. She's much worse. She then demonstrates how she's a psychopath about 10 seconds later when she comes down the stairs. I'm gonna be there when Reese takes you apart. Peace by peace. She uses a kitchen knife to slash Beckman's face and stab him a few times in the stomach. And let me tell you, Beckman takes it like an absolute champ because at no point after this does he show any indication of being stabbed several times in the stomach. Yet another scuffle breaks out, and Janice ends up with the knife in her back that kills her, but not before she's able to very awkwardly get away back up the stairs. Beckman swipes Janice's phone, and soon enough, gets another call from everyone's third favorite Baldwin brother. What? Reese says even more vague culty stuff. The ritual night is upon us. By fighting, all you've done is deprive yourself of a very special journey. I only wish I could have shown you my paradise. And that's pretty much the extent of the conversation. After that, we hear kidnapper number three, Frank, say the absolute best line in the whole movie. He and Reese are talking about Beckman, and he says, This guy is serious. He's a real psychopath. I looked into it. The Koreans, you know what they call him? Agma. The demon. Now, not only is this hilarious because it's the most shameless John Wick ripoff in the whole movie. We call him Baba Yaga. The boogeyman. But it's also hilarious because there aren't any Korean characters in this movie. There are no references to Korea, no references to the Korean mafia or any Korean assassins within the assassin underworld. No one ever speaks Korean. Nothing. Like in John Wick, the villains are Russian. And John Wick has a history with the Russians. So giving the killer assassin protagonist a cool Russian nickname makes sense. In Beckman, it just feels like the writers spun a wheel of languages and rolled with the first one they landed on because otherwise, what the Koreans call Beckman has absolutely no relevancy to the plot. Also giving David A.R. White the nickname The Demon just doesn't seem to check out. The Koreans, you know what they call him? Agma, the demon. To end this scene, cult leader Reese puts out a bounty on Beckman with a $100,000 reward, which, just like in John Wick 3, attracts the attention of all the other assassins in the area who are now going to try to kill Beckman. Reese also, for some reason, puts a bounty on Tom, the strapping young lad from church who we briefly met earlier. Now, the next 15 minutes of the movie are largely irrelevant to the plot and are pretty much just there to drive home the John Wick parallels. First, Beckman fights a couple of assassins in an apartment. For what it is, the action is actually pretty decent, in my opinion. It's not mind-blowing or anything, but it exceeded my expectations for what sort of action sequences Pure Flix could pull off. After that, Beckman fights a different assassin in a brewery, and this scene is a lot more lackluster. Aside from the action, the main point of it is to introduce us to this assassin named the Administrator, who we may or may not hear more from later. Very good. And to give us another John Wick line ripoff. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. I'm gonna finish what I started. That's what I'm gonna do. It's just not the same. Lastly, there's this storage facility slash prison type place that Beckman takes Tom to to keep him safe that I think is supposed to be like the hotel from the John Wick movies. After the war path that Beckman's gone on, Tom serves as his voice of reason or maybe as a voice for the Holy Spirit and he quotes a line from Beckman's sermon from earlier to remind Beckman that he's not too far from God. 
when life is a tumultuous storm. I know what I said. Then look to him. Give God a chance. Aside from the cheesy dialogue and finger guns, there's some emotional weight to this scene, which I think is helped by the actor who plays Tom, who I think is one of the better actors in this movie. Too bad he gets shut in a storage unit and entirely forgotten about for the rest of the film. Perfect. After this, it's on to kidnapper number three, Frank. In order to find Frank, Beckman enlists the help of a hacker. We know this character is a hacker because she looks like the girl from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and she says stuff like, You hired me to crack the firewall. I can't help but you're too basic to get past the encryption. I've got your fingerprints, I've got your DNA, I've got your social spin numbers, transcripts. I will burn your life down in minutes. You know, classic hacker stuff. She does her thing and tells Beckman that he can find Frank at one of Frank's locally owned establishments. Beckman goes to said establishment and sure enough, finds Frank. The two of them go to the back of the restaurant and Frank immediately folds and gives away Reese's location. You know what I want. Where is he? Polecat Ranch, about 10 miles north of Pyro. Since Beckman is two for two as far as killing kidnappers, it's no surprise he's also gonna kill Frank. However, just as he's about to pull the trigger, he gets a surprise phone call from the Assassin Underworld Management. Good evening, Mr. Beckman. Are you prepared to fulfill your debt to the network? You see, earlier, on their way to the back of the restaurant, Frank gave an inconspicuous head nod to Bobby Moynihan over here, which was apparently code for call in a favor to the Assassin Underworld management. Again, I did not pick up on this until after watching this scene several times. Basically, Frank called in a favor and made it so Beckman had to let Frank walk free, lest he face the Assassin Underworld management's wrath, similar to punishments faced in John Wick. Beckman reluctantly agrees, and he looks like he's going to walk away from it all, until he notices a conveniently located book sitting right next to him, filled with photos of the young woman Frank and the others have trafficked, many of which are crossed out. He starts flipping through the pages and eventually comes across Tabitha, whose photo is also crossed out, and despite literally just being told not to shoot Frank, he shoots Frank and kills him. Consistent with what he was told, this incurs the wrath of the Assassin Underworld management, but at this point only in the form of a bunch of angry phone calls to his 50 different phones that he just ends up littering anyway. Beckman drives to Reese's location, and we're squaring up for what looks to be like the final showdown. We see Reese standing between two definitely not CGI fires, with a dead body next to him and a crowd of cultists chanting culty things. Beckman approaches Reese with his gun in hand, and in true cult leader fashion, Reese seems to embrace his fate. This man has come with a very specific purpose. To transition me into the flames. To end my journey here as... Reese. Kill it, preacher. However, just as Beckman is about to achieve a 4.0 KD, the words of his friends and mentors flood through his mind. Reverend! Are you ready to let it all go? All the people you harm? You are called by God. Blessed are the peacekeepers. Blessed are the merciful. I know what I said, so stop. Give God a chance. And in a moment of clarity, he decides to show Reese mercy. No. You live with yourself. Your judgment will come soon enough. He then throws the gun for some reason, and as he's walking away, Reese shares some interesting dialogue. You liar! You fraud! You failure! You two deserve each other! I have no more use for you or her! You take her! You hear me? Take her! That's right, you take her and go! She's being punished down in the barrels. She might even still be alive. I hope she is! So Beckman runs down to the barrels, and surprise, surprise, it turns out that Tabitha, the main character who was conveniently killed off-screen 30 minutes into the movie, has been alive this whole time. And even though I assumed that she was alive this whole time, this ending still really bugs me because one, it's not like it was just implied that Tabitha died. Reese straight up said she was dead. Well, straight up said in his own cult speak way. And in the book of all the trafficking victims, her photo was crossed out. So it's weird that they would go out of their way to confirm her death several times, only to at the last minute pull the old switcheroo and say, ha, gotcha, she's still alive. It's also inconsistent because the whole conflict of the movie is Reese going to great lengths to kidnap Tabitha and keep her in his possession. But as soon as Beckman decides not to kill him, he basically rewards Beckman by telling him where Tabitha is and in doing so gives up what he's worked the entire movie to keep, which doesn't make any sense. Also, why did he ramble on to Tabitha about how he wanted her to join him at the ritual night if, on the night of the ritual, she was just going to be locked up in a barrel anyway? These are important questions I deserve answers to. 
Anyway, Beckman rescues Tabitha, they drive off into the night, and this time it actually seems like all's well that ends well. That is, of course, until we cut back to the cult and another mysterious figure shows up to interrupt things again. Who is that? This is private property! The figure shoots and kills Reese, and when we get a look at his face, we see it's none other than the administrator from earlier. It's done. And Beckman? He's not here. Find him. The implication here is that the administrator is after Beckman, since Beckman incurred the wrath of the Assassin Underworld management, but why he kills Reese, I have no idea. I guess we'll just have to wait for the sequel to have those questions answered. Very good. And that's it. That's Beckman. That is the movie we watched today. So what are my thoughts? Well, obviously the movie's far from perfect, the dialogue is cheesy, the acting is shoddy, and the entire thing is basically a can I copy your homework meme, so I can't give it too much praise. Still though, there are some parts I liked. Like I said earlier, there are some cool zoom shots, and the action in a few scenes isn't horrible. I especially like this shot from the apartment fight scene where one of the assassins is about to stab Beckman, but right as she does, her partner kicks down the door and accidentally pushes her away. Classic Beckman antics. I also like how in the final scene where Beckman rescues Tabitha, they reunite and have this experience. Change. How'd you, how'd you find me? I almost didn't. Meaning that if Beckman had given in to his impulse to kill Reese, he never would have been told where Tabitha was being held and she probably would have been stuck in the cult. Now again, I don't think it makes sense that Reese just gave Tabitha's location away, but since he did, I think Beckman taking the moment to reflect on how things could have gone a lot worse if he didn't listen to the sage voices in his head, aka the Holy Spirit, was touching. Along those lines, what is the big takeaway from this movie? What's the Christian message that's supposed to be conveyed? I think there are a few overarching themes, the biggest one being that vengeance is God's to take and not ours. Although Beckman had to kill three kidnappers and a handful of extras from Gold's gym to learn this lesson, he discovers that it's better to trust God's judgment and timing than it is to play the role of judge, jury, and executioner himself. This pulls from Romans 12, 19, which says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Considering the content and the tone of the movie, I think this theme makes sense, and although it's a clunky and somewhat inconsistent journey for Beckman to come to the conclusion that vigilantism is wrong, I'm glad he got there eventually. The other big theme in the movie is the struggle that Christians face to accept the forgiveness and grace of Jesus and let go of our past sins. This theme is much more implicit than the first one I mentioned and emphasized most heavily in the first act of the movie when Beckman is trying to put his contract killing ways behind him. We see it in the montage at the beginning of the movie when Beckman says he feels unforgivable as well as when he starts packing his bags because he says he feels more like an imposter than an actual pastor. There's no explicit resolution to these feelings as Beckman distances himself from God for the second act and most of the third act of the movie, but again, I think finally choosing to not kill Reese is an allusion to how he accepts Christ's forgiveness and is what enables him to finally walk away from the killing lifestyle. Again, this theme fits the subject matter, but I don't think it's executed as well as it could be. For a Pure Flix exclusive, I expected a more open and shut conclusion about the forgiveness of Jesus, but they don't really do that. They just let Beckman go on killing for an hour and a half and leave you to hope he's accepted Jesus' forgiveness by the end. Maybe that's one of those things that'll get cleared up in the sequel. So overall, was I entertained? Sure. I had pretty low expectations going into it, and I wouldn't go as far as to say that I was impressed by anything, but the action was fine, the story kept my attention till the end, and I gotta see this guy. What have you gotten me into? So I'd say it's not the least entertaining movie you could watch. More than that, is it good for building God's kingdom? Again, I would say, sure. Compared to movies like God's Not Dead, this one has a lot less offensively stereotyped characters, which is a step in the right direction. It also has some biblical takeaways that are valuable. My thoughts though, are that a Christian movie is going to glorify God most when it's just a good movie in general. When the script reflects thoughtful and unique ideas, when the acting conveys believable and relatable characters, when the cinematography creates a unique viewing experience, that's when a movie that's being made to glorify God will glorify God the most. Basically, we glorify God most when we do things with excellence. I know in the movie industry, a lot of those things come down to budget and time constraints, so I'm not saying that Beckman is an utter failure. I'm just saying about it what I would say about a lot of Christian movies, which is that putting more time, money, and effort into making a truly good 
Christian movie instead of just cranking out as many C tier Christian movies as you can will go a long way not just for entertainment purposes but also for the purposes of building God's kingdom. So in the end, does Christian John Wick have a place in cinema and more importantly a place in our hearts? Honestly, I could pass. But I'll let you watch the movie and make the call for yourself. Thank you so much for watching. This video took forever to make and it's going to end up way longer than I intended for it to be. I've never done a movie review before so this has just been me winging it. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe as I have more Christian content just like this video on the way. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you all very much and I will see you in the next one.